I am a tree. So you may be wondering what this talk is about. Well, it all begins with The Giving Tree, one of my childhood classics by Shel Silverstein. I used to think this book was amazing, about a kid who had a tree that kept on giving and always wanted to help. But then my sister, who by the way is Michaela, told me it was a horrible book because the tree kept giving and the kid was so selfish. I am a tree next to the giving tree and the boy. My photoshopping skills aren't the best, but um, in this moment, this story has influenced me and changed me. I have learned from the kid and the tree. I have learned that we are all connected and that we affect each other. This moment has changed the way I think. There is an age-old argument called nature versus nurture. Nature is what you are born with. You can't change it. But nurture is what shapes you. You can decide on that. It's how your parents raise you, your faith, your religion, where you grow up. No two trees are alike. That's kind of like a cliche, yeah? No snowflakes? Well, it's true. <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is, is that what I learned in second grade is that for every year a tree is alive, it gains an extra ring. It becomes wider and it grows, which means the tree is more knowledgeable, yeah? So I've learned that like a tree, we can't go away from our past. Our roots dig into where we were and we grow and expand looking for freedom. The goodness in life or water helps us, but there are also hacks or disruptions that damage us. So five years ago, I went from a sapling to a bigger tree. So I moved from Los Angeles, California to Maui, Hawaii in fifth grade. It was around this time in April and it was a very hard transition. I was a very happy child. Um, I was quite sheltered, I think. Um, not too much had happened. I had lots of friends, but I moved to Maui and I was quite sad because I was leaving behind my old friends and things were changing. But as the year began, Came a little happier, I started making friends. But then, around September or October, my mom got sick and I had to go up to Stanford in Palo Alto, California for her to get treatment. And this is where I was sad again because I was going through a lot of stress and I had to grow up a lot. So when I came back to school, I had some weird ideas. People were starting to make friends already and I had missed that, which was quite hard for me. So there I was, kind of a little sad, but also worried about my mom. It wasn't a top priority schoolwork or making friends, but teachers encouraged me to make friends. So there was two girls, and um, I came up with this radical idea. People could only be friends in groups of three. I saw it everywhere in my mind. Everywhere. In sixth grade, I'm sitting in Mrs. Martellus' room, and I see everyone in groups of three because the desks aligned that way, and I thought, where will I sit? So then I decided I should make some friends, and they wanted to be friends. But this was a very tumultuous and nerve-breaking experience. It wasn't a good friendship, and in eighth grade, I decided that I could do better. I could be happier and not as unsure of myself. I had lost my confidence, but making friends really helped. So, 10th grade English with Mr. Strohacker at Seabury Hall. That is a very philosophical class, might I add. And there's this book, which if you've ever read it, oh goodness. So, Dante Alighieri's The Inferno is a hard book to read, and so I'm reading the book. And as you do, I have an essay to write for Mr. Strohacker. Now, this is an essay that's got to be good. So I'm thinking, what will I write? So I'm talking to my teacher, and I have no clue what I'm going to write, but we get into this conversation about education and how it's like Dante Alighieri's book. Well, in the book, it's about sin and cannibalism of basically materialistic needs. So this is me in class, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So then I'm in this conversation with him about education system. And the education system is materialistic. Let me explain this. We go to school, and we're learning, and we're having fun with our friends. But at the same time, 
the world, when we get out of school, they want to look at where we went, what colleges we're going to, what we're doing in life. They're looking for the materialistic outside, our degrees, not what we're learning. I may enjoy certain subjects, but that doesn't matter as much as what school I went to, what kind of grades I got. And that's a very cannibalistic way. We're eating the person, like in the book, we're eating them and we're not really embracing them in the mind, body, and spirit. So here's another example of change of thinking. So this is Romeo and Juliet. Now, I'm a little rusty on the story. This was a few years ago. But from what I remember, there's Romeo and there's Juliet. They're from two different families, and they love each other. The classic telling is that they're two star-crossed lovers, which means that it's not going to be a happy ending. <laughs> so... The classic telling is that there's a boy and a girl, and they love each other, and so they want to get married. And so they can consummate their relationship. But what if I told you something differently and made you think differently? What if they didn't really love each other and they really want to have sex? Now, who do you think I am? You guys have known me for a few minutes now. Am I crazy? Am I childish? Am I angry? Am I sad? But the truth is, you don't really know me that well because even though I've started talking to you, I haven't told you about who I really am on the inside. And that's what's important. We are each other's environment, and we affect each other in what we do in our everyday actions. Aristotle once said, one swallow does not make a summer's day, nor does a fine day. Similarly, one day or brief time of happiness does not make a person entirely happy. So what if I told you that I have su suffered from severe depression for many years? Oops, what did I hit? <laughs> oh, cool. So, um, one in 20 people suffer from severe depression in the world. I had to do the math, like division and everything. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> So, one in 20 people. Now, there's more than 20 people in here, which means one of you guys probably has severe depression. But I'm not pretending to know exactly who you are, because that's the important thing. We don't really know who each other are until we talk to them, and we have to remember we're not all alike. Suicide is the second leading cause among 15 to 29-year-olds, which are teenagers. So we have to remember that what they're thinking at nighttime when we don't see them, it's a lot different from what we see during the day. Although DNA, which is what we are born with, can play a huge factor in depression or other disorders, the environment or things that have happened to us in our lives can also cause this depression. So it's late at night. It's 2 in the morning on a school night. Kids are about to go to bed. And you don't want to disrupt them. They have to get up in four hours, four or five hours. But you're feeling kind of lonely. Well, the good news is the world isn't all on the same time zone. So there are people in other places where you can talk to them. So a great thing to do is if you're feeling lonely or stressed out, you can talk to these lines that I have found online. And, I was in, and you can do that. So a childhood hero of mine, Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, told me, well, not me personally, but like through his quotes, he said, there are three ways to ultimate success. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. So last night I was going through a bit of a rough time, and Michaela was like, I'm going to send her a quote. And she sends me a quote from Mr. Rogers, and it makes me feel a lot better, you know? Because when you are a kid, you're very happy, but you're sheltered. So it's important to remember that sometimes it's nice just to send a text to someone and say, how is your day? It's important to be kind to others. Thank you.